2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to just spend our time today in uh, verses 16 to 21. So let's read it together again here before we uh, begin thinking about these verses together. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 16 it says, I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast, boast myself a little. That which I speak, <clears throat> I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wheresoever wherein any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Did you get that? That makes sense to everybody when I read that through there? If it did, then you're doing a little better than I, did. I, I was, because when I first read this passage, I was like, what is the Bible trying to say to me today? And uh, so we want to spend our time here this morning. I have an advantage on you that I've had more opportunity to study and more time to study it this past week than those of you who are opening up to read it this morning for the first time and uh, maybe haven't had a chance to think about it ahead of time. I have that advantage. But I, and, and the Holy Spirit is here to teach us, and so I have confidence that in the course of our time here we'll come to understand what these words are saying. Uh, the essence here of what is happening in this portion of Scripture is that the Apostle Paul is defending his apostleship. We saw that even beginning back in the beginning of this chapter. We've talked about it now for, I think, three or four weeks. Uh, there were those in the city of Corinth and among the church there who were challenging the, quest, the, the point of whether the Apostle Paul was indeed an apostle sent from Christ. And so you see him. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to dismiss the younger children for their children's church. Go ahead and slip on out there, guys. They do whether I dismiss them or not. Good for them, too. Verse 5, it says, I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. Though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But we have been truly made manifest unto you in all things. Looking a little farther forward, we'll see that he continues on this, uh, on this track here until it gets into chapter 12. Verse 11, it says this, I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commanded of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And so here's a chapter and a half, almost two chapters, where the apostle Paul is defending his office as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now why is this important? It's because the apostleship office carries the authority of the Word of God. In those days, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the 66 books that we read and study so carefully today. They had apostles to preach the Word of God to them. And when those apostles spoke or wrote under the authority of the apostleship, they were speaking and writing the Word of God. So a person saying the Apostle Paul was not an apostle was challenging the authority of God's Word. Now what other authority can we preach under than the authority of God's Word? Imagine, if you will, with me what it would be like if we lose this concept that the Bible is the Word of God. What happens to us in dealing with our world around us? Look around you in the world today. I, I suppose you have. I do. Uh, somewhat and uh, I am becoming more and more convinced all the time that we are gearing up towards a vicious battle between believers and non-believers I really believe that with all my heart um, one of the key battlegrounds upon which this battle is being fought today and will be fought I think in the future is what do we do with people who have a homosexual preference for their lives who are oriented homosexually and of course, it's a big issue today because it was just this past Thursday that the city of Pocato passed an ordinance uh, that was saying that you can't discriminate to people on the, against people on the basis of their sexual orientation. And so it's a hot issue here. It's a hot issue because just this uh, couple months ago, they said that in the military, now you can be openly homosexual. And uh, it's just, it were, it's, it's a battle that is flaring up in all different realms and regions. Now, let me say this. In my opinion, the core of the battle is not about anybody's sexuality. 
The core of the battle is about whether we believe the Bible is the authoritative word of God. Because the Bible is quite clear about homosexuality. I could show you some verses that are quite clear saying that homosexuality is a perversion of the natural use of sexuality which God gave to humans. It is clear in Scripture. But we are living in a culture in which there are a number of people who, first of all, don't even believe the Bible is God's Word. It's interesting when you read blogs and comments on blogs that many of the people in the homosexual community don't even believe in the existence of God. If they do believe in the existence of God, they do not believe that the Bible is God's Word, or that if it is God's Word, it doesn't really mean what we think it means, or that we thought it's meant for thousands of years. And it's been perverted, or mistranslated, or it's been diluted, and things have been put into it that were not intended to be put there by God. The question comes down to this, not how you want to exercise your sexuality, but do you believe the Bible is God's Word speaking to people? We are sliding into a post-biblical era of human history. And I think about that, and I think I, my, my whole career, I guess, if you want to call it a career, my ministry is standing and saying, this is God speaking to people. And if you'll live according to the way that God says, you will find, first of all, eternal life, and secondly, happiness in this life. And when I see a culture that is moving towards undermining the authority of God's Word, I see we are headed for unhappiness and eternal destruction. Amen. So it's a concern to me. Now that same concern that I feel today in 2013, and by the way, I'm not really worried about it. I think in the end, the church triumphs and Jesus wins. <laughs> I'm not really that concerned about it. We might have to go through a time of persecution. We might suffer. Um, they might come along and say, if you are going to preach the kind of things that you preach in the Bible, then we're going to throw you in prison or fine you or take away your property. Then we might go through that kind of thing in the future. That's been something that's happened to believers throughout history. And it might happen to us in our lifetimes. But I want to tell you this. I know Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Amen. And in the end, the church wins and Jesus wins. But having said that, you understand our concern for the undermining of the authority of the Word of God. Now back in Paul's day, it was not the 66 books that were written. It was the office of the apostle that was the equivalent. And so in Corinth, when these men came in and said, well, Paul's not really an apostle of Christ. He does not speak with divine authority. It was the same exact issue that I just pointed out here in our own culture today. So Paul takes a great amount of time, a significant portion of the paper of this letter, and a significant portion of his ink and his time to argue the fact that he is indeed an apostle of Christ. We've looked at that for four weeks now. We've talked about what is the, uh, the, um, the mark of an apostle. We talked about his act as an apostle. We talked about the marks and acts of false apostles in verses 13 and 15. And he's going to carry on this same thought beginning in verse 16. And I want to show you what he's saying in his argument here this morning. But let's take a few moments and just bow our heads and ask God's help to understand the Word of God this morning. Father, we thank you first of all for this privilege of being here. We thank you that we can know for sure that you speak to us in the pages of your, of your Word. And we can build our lives with confidence upon it, not, not, knowing not only that we will have eternal life when we die, uh, but that we will have the blessedness and peace and happiness of knowing that we are living as you desire us to live here on this earth. And Father, I pray that you would purify our minds, bring us into a consistency of thought uh, with your scriptures uh, that would be uh, most able to, to grasp that happiness. And even today, as we think about these things, may you form us in us the image of your Son a little more. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So verses 16 to 20, I want you just to look at it again. Now, there's a phrase in verse 18 you probably have, or verse 19 you probably have heard before. It's kind of a common phrase. Seeing then that you are, or excuse me, verse 19, for ye suffer fools gladly. Have you ever heard anybody say that about somebody? Uh, usually it's in the other, it's the negative side of that. That's a person who does not suffer fools well. <laughs> 
And they, it, what, what's, the, what's the idea? What's the picture of someone who doesn't suffer fools well? That's someone who has no patience for people who act or speak foolishly. Okay? Now that's a phrase that we have in our common culture that came right out of Scripture. And it's talking about the Corinthians, it says, as it says here, they do suffer fools gladly. I want you to see the process of thought here, the Apostle Paul here, the basic process of his thought. In this passage, Paul says that he is about to begin boasting. He's about to begin boasting about himself. You see that in verse 16. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. Paul's warning them here. Hey, brothers and sisters, I'm about to begin boasting. As I say in the South, I'm fixing to start boasting. Okay? So he's, he's telling that's what's coming up here. And we're going to see that in the next couple of weeks as we look at some of the verses ahead of us. Now, I want you to know this about boasting. Boasting is a type of foolishness. That's what Paul's saying there. Yet as a fool receive me that I may boast myself a little. Paul says, I'm going to boast. And he understands that's a foolish thing to do. And he says in verse uh, 17, I speak not for the Lord, but as it were foolishly. Verse 21, I speak. In the parentheses there, I speak foolishly. Verse 23, I speak as a fool. Paul knows he's about to enter into an endeavor that is a a, a type of foolishness. Even way back in verse 1, he said this, Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. <clears throat> he says, I'm going to start bo boasting, and he admits that boasting is a type of foolishness. Now, do you guys agree that boasting is foolishness? I agree. I think so. I think we walk around talking about how good we are and how great we are. We are merely entering into a fool's endeavor. Boasting is an expression of our own self-concept. It's our own sense of our superiority over others. You know, I'm smarter than you. I do better at mathematics than you. Or I know more facts than you. Or I'm better looking than you. Or I'm stronger than you. Or I'm faster than you. We, we see children do this a lot of times. And we can see the foolishness of that kind of boasting. We stand outside look at them and say, well, you really don't know that much. I love to watch, well, I shouldn't say I love to. I remark about how my children some, sometimes do this. You know, one of them will be in a higher grade level and uh, then another one, and they'll start rattling off facts they're learning at their grade level and kind of making it clear that because so-and-so in a lower grade level doesn't know these facts, somehow they're just inferior. And I say, well, you know what? I try to tell them, you know what? When your sister gets to grade, she's going to know the same stuff you know. And you know what else? I know a lot more than you do. And I could carry that farther and say there's a lot of people that know more than I do. Boasting is foolishness. It's comparing ourselves to other people. Usually we choose people that are inferior to us to compare ourselves and so make ourselves feel better, right? Paul's already talked about this foolishness before. Do you remember back in chapter 10 and verse 12? We dare not make ourselves with a number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. What's the opposite of being wise? Being a fool. You start comparing yourself and commending yourselves by the measure of other people. Paul says, you're not wise. You're a fool. But Paul says, I'm about ready to start boasting. I know it's a foolish thing to do. It's also something that's not after the Lord. You notice he says that in verse 17, that which I speak. And he says later in verse 21, I speak foolishly. I speak as concerning reports. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord. Now let me, let me make this clear. That does not mean that what Paul says here is not inspired by God. It does not mean that. What that means is that boasting is not something the Lord did. Think about it. You think about what you know of Lord Jesus Christ and his life. Recorded for us in the Gospels. Can you think of a time, an occasion, when the Lord Jesus Christ ever began to boast of himself? You know? Could he have <laughs> compared himself with others? Could he have commended himself by others? Yes, he could have. He was God the Son in the flesh. But even our Lord Jesus Christ, who could have honestly boasted, did not. I want to say this, it was not characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ to boast, it is also not a characteristic of the followers of Jesus Christ to be boasters. 
We ought not to be going around talking about how great we are. You know why? Because anything we are and anything we have in the way of knowledge or talents or abilities have been given to us as a gift from God. If we are going to boast as believers, we ought to be like Jeremiah. And we ought to be like the Apostle Paul who said things like, we will bo boast of the Lord. We will boast of the things that we receive of the, Lord, of the Lord. And pointing that glory not to us, but pointing the glory that we receive in our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ who gave us all things. It's not a characteristic of believers to boast. It's not a characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ to boast. But nonetheless, the Apostle Paul is going to enter into some boasting in just a moment. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's not, it is a type of foolishness. Now, Paul warned them that he was going to act a little foolish here. You saw that, bear with me in my folly, I'm about to start boasting. But I want you to see the basic process of thought here. Listen carefully. He says in verse uh, 17, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were fool foolishly in the confidence of boasting. Confidence means foundation. He says upon this foundation of boasting, he is going to be proving that he is an apostle. In other words, by his boasting, he's going to try to prove to them again that he is indeed an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, the verse, I've already read it, but I'll read it again. Chapter 12, a little farther forward, verse 11. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were done among you. So the apostle Paul says, I'm going to enter into this foolishness, this boasting, in order to do what? To prove to you that I am indeed an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you say, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. How is he going to prove he's an apostle of Christ by boasting, which is not something Christ did? Now, let's follow the process of the thought here and see how this works out. I think, actually, it's a masterful stroke of uh, logical genius. I lead, look at this and I say, well played, Apostle Paul, <laughs> well played. And we'll see that here as we go through this in a little bit. Let's follow the, I'll show you the basic process of thought. I'm going to show you the purpose of the thought. He says in, <clears throat> in, um, in verse uh, 19, for ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. Ye suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. Notice what he says. I'm going to act a little foolish. I'm going to be a little boastful. I'm going to do that because you have a characteristic of suffering fools gladly. I'm going to become a fool because you listen to fools. You pay attention to fools. And that's why I'm going to do this during this time. Now, I want to say this. The Apostle Paul is not condemning them for this act. Almost all the commentaries you read on this passage will say that in this statement, the Apostle Paul is being sarcastic. You yourselves are wise. They, I, I read one commentator said, this is a statement that's just dripping with sarcasm. I respectfully, those commentators are smarter than I am and probably much more educated than I am, but I, I respectfully disagree. I do not believe the Apostle Paul is being sarcastic with this statement. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a place where the Apostle Paul dealt with people in a sarcastic way. There are some places, again, the commentators say this, but I think the more you study, you start to see this is not sarcasm here. This is really, he's speaking and commending them for suffering fools gladly. I want to show you this uh, to you this in, in this passage, and I want you to see that what they are doing here in verse 19, suffering fools gladly, is a godly act. He's commending them for the godliness and the wisdom of their suffering fools gladly. It says here that they suffer fools gladly. The word suffer you see in verses 19 and 20, the same Greek word means simply to endure. Okay? To endure through something, to put up with something. Are there people in your life that you put up with? You endure them. You suffer them. Are there people like that in your life? I think we are all, if we were honest, say, you know, there's some people in my life that I wouldn't say they are a source of joy and pleasure and comfort and in such a moment. But I treat them well and I treat them respectfully. In other words, I endure the relationship that I have with them. I have a friend, and I call him friend with all sincerity. I'm not at all being... Uh, stretching that. And I believe he's a brother in the Lord. I believe he knows Jesus as a Savior. I think he's, I think he's a brother. He's, I think he's a little confused about some things in Scripture. And he has on several occasions essentially told me 
that he didn't think I was saved and going to heaven. <laughs> and I discussed that with him, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm saved because I'm proud. I'm saying, I explained to him, even this week he said that, and I, I told him, I looked him straight in the eye and said, listen, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when I die, I will be in heaven with Christ. And I said, I know that because I have a promise in Scripture that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's just one of many promises we can seize in Scripture on this matter of salvation. Is I've trusted Christ as my Savior. I do not believe there's anything else that I've done or that I can do or that I will ever, ever do that will make me worthy of heaven, but I have trusted that Jesus paid the price for my sins before my God. And I said, based on the promise of Scripture, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I am going to be in heaven someday. But yet he'll come back and say, well, I don't think you're really saved because he has his reasons. You know what? I never treat this friend disrespectfully. There are times when he irritates me. There are, time, there are times when, uh, when I just, uh, you know, I just rather not talk to him. But I understand that part of the commandment that we have as Christians is to love the brethren. And the way that I love the brethren in the case of this man is just to be kind and respectful as I discuss things with him that sometimes are even blunt. And I mean, to me, he's blunt and almost offensive in the words and just to not take offense and deal with it in a respectful way. That is what's talking about. It says suffering fools. Okay, that kind of an idea. And I'm not calling him a fool, but that's the idea of suffering with a person. And so it just simply means to put up or to bear with somebody. It's treating them respectfully, even though they may be offensive to you or disagree with you, angry at you, continuing to treat them respectfully. By the way, the world has a fetish with tolerance. And I want to say this clearly. I'm not going to develop this thought very much today, but tolerance is not a biblical value. It is not a, an American value. And I'm going back to our American founding documents. It is not a, a value that we ought to hold to. The value that the Bible presents that we believers ought to have, and the value that I think is upheld by our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, is not tolerance, but respect. The Bible teaches us we need to respect every single person because they are made specially by God in the image of God. It doesn't matter if they disagree or we disagree with them or things they do make us mad or not, we still ought to respect them. Tolerance is something different. And ironically, while the world has been selling our culture the idea of tolerance, and it's being taught them everywhere, you need to be tolerant, you need to be tolerant. While we're selling this idea of tolerance to everybody, what has been growing? Disrespect. It's ironic, isn't it? It's because we've gotten off the biblical mandate. The biblical mandate is to be respectful to people. And I don't care who you're talking to or what they say to you or what they look like or how they act. We always understand that every single person is formed by God in the image of God. And not only that, but they have been died for by the Lord Jesus Christ who loves them enough to, send, uh, to give his life for them. They deserve to be respected for that fact and nothing else. So we handle these people respectfully. We endure uh, we endure, we suffer people. And in this situation, we suffer fools. These Corinthians suffered fools. They endured fools. They dealt with people who were fools in respectful and kind ways. Not calling names, not getting mad, not lashing back, not reacting, but just dealing with them in respectful ways. Now I tell you that this is a trait of godliness. Now, I want to spend some time here this morning talking about the word fool. Because we have a lot of fools in our world today. Okay, It's not as pejorative of a term. It is pejorative, but it's not as pejorative a term as you think it is. Okay, When, I, when we say fool today, we oftentimes think of that as being a slander against a person's character or their intelligence or something like that. But this particular word, there are other words in the Greek that are translated fool, but this particular word simply means not understanding. People who do not understand. And I want to say it again today, as clear as I can, this world today is filled with fools. There are people all around us who don't really get what's going on. Okay, Let me give you an example of the use of this word. Look with me, if you will, at a parable of our Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 12 and verse 20. Luke chapter 12 and verse 20. <clears throat> 
By the way, you might say, well, I think the Bible tells us not to call people fools, right? Well, there is, yes, in the Beatitudes, the Lord Jesus says that if any man shall say thou fool, he is in danger of the hellfire. A different Greek word, which is a slander of a person's character. In this uh, situation, we have a word that Jesus used in Luke chapter 12 and a word that we find in our text this morning for people who just simply don't get the reality of things. So Luke chapter 12 and verse, I'm going to start before verse 20, the beginning of this parable. <clears throat> it says in verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, look what I've accumulated in life. I've got more than enough for what I need. I've done a good job. I've invested well. I've worked hard. I've got all this stuff. I've got more than I need. And so now I can just sit back and relax, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And so this is the idea of the person that says here uh, in this text, a certain rich man. Now look what Jesus says next. But God said to him, now fool. Or thou man that doesn't really understand. And why doesn't he understand? Can anybody think why he doesn't understand? Because he doesn't understand that there is more to life than having a barn full of food. So he says, Thou fool, this night thy soul, or thy life, shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth treasure up for himself and is not rich toward God. The point Jesus is making is that we have a world full of people who are living for the here and the now. To have a little food on the table, a little pleasure, a little bit of happiness. And they're not thinking about eternity, just like this certain rich man. Not thinking about eternity is called an, a fool or a man who doesn't really understand. Listen, your lives on this earth are not about your life on this earth. They're not really. They're about the fact that you have an eternal soul that will spend somewhere forever. And you have a privilege in this life of trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior and having the guarantee that you will spend eternity with Him in heaven. Being born again by faith. And then those of you who have made that decision, and that's probably the vast majority of you in this room, those of you that have made that decision to trust Christ, you have the privilege of investing the rest of your life in laying up treasure in heaven, telling others about Jesus, living a life of godliness that reflects well upon the Lord and draws people to Christ, puts a thirst or hunger in their hearts, if you will, for that righteousness, supporting missionaries, supporting the work of God in various places. These are privileges and opportunities you have to take your life in this earth and lay it up as a treasure in heaven. And the believer who grasps that concept begins to understand that what really matters is what I do for eternity. Not what I do for this earth. But most of the world doesn't live that way, do they? Most of the world lives thinking here, now, is all that matters. You know, we go out soul winning, knocking on doors or witnessing, and one of the tactics, one of the approaches that we use is called uh, Share Jesus Without Fear, and we start with five questions. The first question I ask is, what are your spiritual beliefs? You know something that has begun to amaze me? It happens more often now than, than, than I've ever noticed, than I, really, than I ever expected. Is I ask people, what are your spiritual beliefs? And they'll tell me something like, I don't have any. I'll say, I'll even ask it, do you have any spiritual beliefs? And some people just tell me, no. And I stand back and I wonder, how can a person not have any spiritual beliefs? How? It's hard for me to understand because I was raised in a Christian home, went to church all my life, and it seemed like I've always been thinking about spiritual things to some extent or another. Maybe you're the same way, but there are people in this world who are going through their life in this existence, and they tell me anyway, now, maybe they're just saying that because they want me to leave them alone and move on down the street. But they tell me anyway they don't have any spiritual beliefs. Are there people like that out there really? I think that there are. They're living from this day to the next day, and they're never thinking about what happens to them after they die. They're never thinking about how they can know their Creator. 
They have no spiritual beliefs. You know what that is? That's exactly what this word is talking about. A fool is not understanding their existence. I want to look at some cross-references with this. You're in Luke chapter 12, but I'd like you to look over to Psalms chapter 49. It's a perfect parallel to Luke chapter 12. A perfect parallel. And so I want to read that here this morning with you. Psalm 49. And uh, this is talking about people who are, uh, are like this. Uh, verse, um, verse 10 is talking about how God views people. And it says in verse 10, For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Doesn't that sound like Luke 10, the certain rich man? They die and they leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. And their dwelling places to all generations, they call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being an honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. This, their way, is folly. Yet their posterity approved their saying, Selah. In other words, their descendants or those around them say, well, he was a wise man. Look at how much money he made in his life. Look at the name he left behind. Look at it, the inheritance he gave his children. And the Bible says their way is folly. In fact, it says in verse uh, 10, it says the, the fool and the brutish person. You know what a brutish person is? It's a person that acts like an animal. That's what brute means, right? Brute is an animal, a beast. People who act like this are people who act like animals. Let me ask you this. What makes a human different from um, an animal? What is it? Okay, someone told me opposable thumbs. No. Apes have opposable thumbs, okay? It's not opposable thumbs. What is it? it is the man, it's, a, it's the spirits, what it is. But it's man's ability to comprehend spiritual things. Beasts don't do that. By the way, beasts are made very similar to us. They have skin, they have bones, they have skeletons, they have meat, muscles, they have vascular systems, and all this a very similar design in a lot of beasts. In fact, that's where some of the idea of the theory of evolution comes from, because there's similarity of design. But there is something that a man has, a human person has, that no beast has, and that is the ability to comprehend their creator and their eternity. But what happens when a person never has a spiritual thought? They're acting like beasts. Okay? Beasts, all they think about is where's my next meal and where can I have where can I mate? Are there people like that in our world today? That's the way they live. They live like beasts. Now we still respect them, but this is what a fool is. A fool is someone who doesn't really understand. Look at another passage of scripture in the book of Psalms, Psalm 73. Psalm 73, just skipping forward a little bit here. Psalm 73 is a psalm in which a godly man, Asaph, was envious of, of ungodly men. Verse 3, I was envious of the foolish. He was envious of ungodly men because ungodly men seem to have success in life, right? They seem to have success. Look at with me, if you will, at verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in their riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. You know, the ungodly people, they're getting wealthy. They're, getting, they're, they're succeeding in life. They're not sick. They're not ill. And yet here I am and I've tried to live godly before the Lord, Asaph, the writer says. I've tried to be godly. And what have I got for it? Suffering and chastening. I have done all this godliness in vain. And by the way, the world would love to come along and try to reinforce that thought to you. You're following Jesus for nothing. What is Jesus doing for you? Why don't you follow the way we're going and have success? And Asaph says, what am I doing? What am I? But then he, be, he begins to meditate on that, and the Holy Spirit begins to deal with him, and he begins to understand that. So it says here in verse 21, Thus was my heart grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. What is it that is the characteristic of this kind of fool? He doesn't know. He's ignorant. He doesn't know. He doesn't understand what life is really about. Even though he may be wealthy, he doesn't understand what the godly know 
and that is that there is an eternity, and there's a God to whom we will give an account. Look again at Psalm 92. Psalm 92. <clears throat> I'm going to just pick out two verses here, verses uh, 5 and 6. It says, O Lord, how great are Thy works! Have you ever been out in God's creation and just had that thought? You look at the rivers and the valleys and the mountains and the trees. You, you get a microscope and you look at some of the detail of God's creation and you just come away saying, wow, oh Lord, how great are thy works. Have you ever stopped and thought about how God provides for you so you can live? Provides food, provides house, and just said, Lord, how great. You know, here, here's just an illustration. Uh, the, the, the sun is the source of the energy for this entire planet. We don't get any energy in this planet from anywhere else except the sun, except for through nuclear uh, fusion. There's no other place we get energy. If you, if you burn oil, coal, whatever, that, at some point that was energy that came from the sun. But the sun has this tremendous amount of energy, but everything the sun touches, it kills. Okay, if you go out and lay out in the sun for 20 hours, you're going to come back toasted, burnt. And the longer things stay out in the sun, the more they break down, the more they, they destroy themselves. But God made something miraculous. There's only one thing that God has made that's miraculously able to convert the energy of the sun into use, a usable form. It's called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll in the leaves of plants and trees and grasses and stuff can take the energy of the sun and grow with it instead of die. And what do those plants provide for us? Food. God is wonderful. Thy works are great. And then you read on here, it says, O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. And the more you meditate on God, the more you understand God is a well without a bottom. You'll never reach the end of understanding God. And I just, I just love learning more about God, finding out new things. I really think we're going to spend our eternity learning more about God and never reach the end of it. God is vast like that. He's boundless like this, limitless. His thoughts are very deep. And by the way, I think the more we get, an, we, we become in awe of the thoughts of God, the deep thoughts of God, the more we stand in awe of Him, the more we love Him. But His thoughts are very deep. You know, the, the irony of it is that most people have a very shallow concept of God. But the Bible reveals to us a God that's beyond our, limit, our, our understandings of understand, our, the limits of our understanding. Thoughts are very deep. So what do we come away with? Oh Lord, how great are the works and the thoughts are very deep. But a brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. You know, a brutish man goes out and looks at the same creation you look at. And you say, oh God, thy works are great. What does he look at that creation as? Something to give him pleasure. You know, let's, uh, let's take the, uh, the barley and let's uh, malt it down and make something to make ourselves feel good. Let's take the, the grapes and make wine and get ourselves intoxicated so we can escape the troubles that surround us. He takes the same creation that makes us stand in awe of God and says, how can this make me happy? How can this give me pleasure? You know, Ray and I were talking about this. He goes out and we, you know, riding in, in the creation. He looks, stops and looks at all the mountains around him and says, wow, how great God is. Someone else comes up there and all they're there for is the thrill. Same motorcycle, same setting, same scene, and all they want is the adrenaline rush out of it. What is a person who looks at the great works of God and sees nothing but an opportunity to have pleasure for themselves called? A brute. A brutish man. And it goes on to say this in verse 6, Neither doth a fool understand this. A fool is someone who looks at the creation God has given to us and does not understand that it is God that has given it to us. Interestingly enough, a lot of these people who are fools have advanced degrees. <laughs> They're doctors of biology or doctors of botany or doctors of geology and chemistry. They're the scientists of this world and the world holds up science as though it is infallible proof and evidence. And they'll look at this same creation that you and I say, well, that just is such evidence of a creator. Look at that and say, well, this happened over billions and billions of years of natural evolution. What the Bible calls that? Foolishness. It's a fool. He cannot see what is obviously before his face. The most basic layman can understand it. 
But this man with all of his degrees cannot see it. He cannot see the forest for the trees. That's a fool, right? Psalm 92. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 1. You notice how all these uses are talking about people who just don't get it? That's my point. I'm trying to reinforce with a lot of verses, but when we, to say fool, you're in the Scripture, with this particular use of the word, we're talking about people who just don't get it. So Proverbs chapter 12 is another verse where we have the same idea. It says this, Whoso loveth instruction, loveth wisdom or knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Look at Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 2. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 2. It says, Surely I am more brutish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. So brutishness, foolishness is attached with this idea of not really comprehending the spiritual realities that are around us. Now I want you to jump forward to the New Testament and look at 2 Peter chapter 2 because we're going to translate this thought into the more direct thought of what the Apostle Paul is talking about. 2 Peter chapter 2 is a passage in which Peter the Apostle, different man here, same Holy Spirit, but different man, is talking about the danger of false teachers. We actually looked at this last week. We looked at the first couple of verses of this uh, chapter. Remember I said, in, I read in verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, and as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately or secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, and etc. So false prophets and false teachers. The whole chapter is dealing with these people. But look what it says in verse 12. It says, but these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption let me give you an example from right here in our city of Pocatello everybody got the newspaper on Friday morning it was one of their mass distribution uh, editions and I, I don't think that was accidental by the way I think they knew that the hearing about the homosexual ordinance was gonna be on Thursday they want to make sure everybody knew about it the day after I think that was probably completely planned if you don't think the Iowa State Journal is totally on board with uh, the advancement of the homosexual agenda you haven't read it very much and I don't read it very much but um, it was in there and one of the things they were talking about the ordinance which had not been finalized by the time they went to print they're talking about some of the testimony there, and they had, they had uh, something someone had said there, which is, it, echoes, it echoes something I read on blogs or in comments and blogs a lot of times on this issue. And they'll say something like, like this, and she said something like this, if there is a God, then that God has, uh, loves everybody, or created everybody equally, I think that's what she said, created everybody equally. And I, I believe that God did create everybody equally, by the way. I'm not disagreeing with that. But do you, see, do you see the logical fallacy with that statement? If there is a God, then he is this way. How do you know he's that way if you don't even know he exists? Does that make sense to you? Where's the logic in that? I'm not sure if there is a God, but there is a, is a God that he's got to be like I say he is. <laughs> you don't even know he exists. How can you know what he's like? It's just that's an example of how we have enshrined foolishness in our thinking. Illogical, unreasonable, and yet people go around using, the, it's, it's what we call a sophistry. Sophistry is something that sounds wise, but it's not. It sounds wise, but it's absolutely unwise to say if there is a God, then he is such. The only way we know that there is a God is because he's revealed himself. The only way we know how he is is because he has revealed himself as he is. We have to start by saying, God has spoken in his word. So anyway, uh, that's just an example of their speaking evil things that they understand not. By the way, Jude, another apostle, says the same thing. Look at the book of Jude. Almost identical words, really. The book of Jude is just a one-chapter book right before Revelation. I know most of you can find that. But Jude chapter, or Jude verse 10, there's no chapter there, speaking of the same kinds of false teachers, uh, as it says in verse 4, crept in unawares, before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, denying to turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, etc. But look at verse 10, it says, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts and those things they corrupt themselves. So what, what's the point of all this? The point, I, I took you a lot of verses to show you what? A fool is someone who just doesn't get it. They don't understand. They don't understand the spiritual realities. And by the way, 
there can be Christian fools. They know a little bit. They know that there's eternity. They know they can go to heaven by trusting Christ, but they don't get so much more they could be getting. And that's why we challenge ourselves as believers to be in the Word, reading, listening, studying, learning. It's a lifelong endeavor, right? To learn of Christ. That's why we're disciples. Because we're following day by day by day. It is this idea of false teachers that Paul's dealing with in our text. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, go back there with me. Remember, it's the false teachers. He says in verse 13, such are false apostles, deceitful workers. They're coming along saying that Paul is not an apostle, but they are really not apostles. So fools. So he says, you suffer fools gladly. Fools are people who just don't get it. Let me ask you this. How should we deal with people who don't get it? How should we deal with a person that comes along with a sophistry like saying, if there was a God, then he'd have to be like this. How do we deal with them? Angrily? We call them bad names? We make fun of them? No. Exactly right. We treat them respectfully and kindly like Jesus would. That's how we suffer fools in this world. And you'll have opportunities to do it, by the way, at work, in your family maybe. Lots of places you'll have opportunities to do this. And the Apostle Paul says they suffer fools gladly. Now I want to show you some of the things that they did suffer with these fools. Look at verse 20. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. Five things are listed here in which they suffer fools. Examples in which they suffer fools. Here they are again. If a man bring you into bondage, they suffer being enslaved. Have you ever felt enslaved by somebody? It seems like every time you turn around, they're just using you. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? They make all kinds of demands on your time, on your... Your, your, your abilities just seem like every time they're, they're telling you or asking you to do something. Sometimes you want to just tell them, listen, I can't help you today. And you know that they're just using you. Paul says we suffer if a person does this, if a person uh, enslaves you. Secondly, and by the way, it means to slave down. It has to do with the idea of being burdened down, bogged down under a burden that's being constantly put upon you by this person. Secondly, if a man devour you, what's that talking about? It's talking about cannibalism. You've got fools that are around you trying to eat on you. You should allow them to do that. No, we're not talking about that. Okay, we're not talking about people devouring you physically. We're talking about people. Have you ever heard this term? Who eat you out of house and home. <laughs> That's what it's talking about. They consume your stuff. They consume your time. They consume your energy. Seem like they're always a drain on you. You know, it's the relatives that come over and they stay, and they stay, and they stay, and they stay. <laughs> it's the friend that comes over, opens the refrigerator, and says, hey, got any milk? <laughs> you know, and I, I'm not trying to be facetious. If you're okay with that, that's fine. But sometimes it seems like there are some people, it's just like, you know, what's the limit when they stop just taking my stuff? And Paul says, you suffer being devoured. If a man take of you. Now this is the idea, more than that, this is the idea of someone actually robbing from you. In other words, they have used force of some sort to take from you something that's not theirs. They've robbed you. Paul says, I commend you, you suffer fools when they take from you. If a man exalt himself, here's the guy going around boasting, talking about how great he is, looking down on you and exalting himself and when they're in the presence of arrogant people, what do they do? They act kindly and respectfully, as they should. And then fifthly, if a man smites you on the face, here's a person that physically abuses, and they simply treat the person with kindness and respect. Let me ask you something. Is this the right thing to do? Well, let's start with the last one. A man smiting you on the face. Have you heard Jesus ever say anything like that? Turn to Matthew chapter 5, would you? Turn to Matthew chapter 5. And let's just think about these five things again and think about some of the things that these believers had heard taught that were teachings of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 39, it says this, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now I'm not going to take time today to teach what this is really saying. 
Okay? I do not believe this is teaching us that we need to allow ourselves to be victimized. I don't think that's what it's teaching. I don't think it's teaching us that we should never uh, uh, try to pursue justice if someone has done something wrong to us. I don't think that's the scope of this. But I'm not going to spend time developing this. It's not a thought here. Let's just, let's just stop by saying this. There are certainly some people who believe that this teaches that if someone smites you on the cheek, you should say, turn around and say, hey, hey, come back and do this one too. You know, it's that, that's the idea. It's, it, we, we interpret it differently, but the point is Jesus had taught this. And these people in Corinth were taking Jesus' teaching seriously when they were suffering fools to smite them on their face. Whether we agree with their interpretation or not is irrelevant. The point is, they value God's Word enough to try to be obedient to what Christ was teaching. You see that? Let's think about some of the other five, of the five here. We talked about being uh, smitten, on the, smitten on the cheek. Jesus clearly tells us you know, to turn the other cheek when a person smites us on the cheek. What about the other one? What about robbery? Someone takes from you. Look in Matthew 5 and verse 40. If any man shall sue thee the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Here it's a robbery by legal process. Does that ever happen? People use a legal system to rob other people? Someone laughed. <laughs> yeah, occasionally. Now it's not coming in with a club and taking, but it's coming in with a club of law, suing and taking something that belongs to you. It's your coat. What does Jesus say? Give him your cloak as well. People in Corinth took that seriously. If someone took from them, they suffered those fools to do that. Let's think about another one. Is it right to suffer being eaten out of house and home? Look at Matthew 5 and verse 42. Give to him that asketh of thee, and from him that would borrow thee turn not away. Same idea, isn't it? What about uh, being used by people? Is it right to bear with or allow people to use you? Look at Matthew 5 and verse 41. Whosoever shall compel thee to go with him a mile, go with him too. Back in those days, the Roman soldiers who served in the Roman Empire were allowed to, get, to grab anybody they wanted to out of the, out of the, off the side of the road and say, you must bear my pack with me for a mile. It was the Roman law that every person in the Roman Empire was compelled, if they were asked by a Roman soldier, to carry his pack with him for a mile. And so a soldier could get by pretty well. You know, I mean, go for a mile... Okay, I've done, my, I've done what law requires. <clears throat> then you get someone else to do it as well. That's using people, isn't it? You know, you have other things to do with your day. I'm on my way to the, you know, to, to the vet, or I'm on my way to, to, to get some, some lunch. And soldiers said, no, you've got to walk with me a mile. That means you have to walk a mile and walk back, right? Two miles. But what does Jesus say here? If a person compels you to go with him a mile, compels you, go with him too. You know, there are people out there who will use you. The people in Corinth took it seriously and they said, when people use us, we're going to allow it. We're going to suffer those fools. Well, what about, what about proud people? What about bearing with proud people? And it doesn't say anything here in Matthew, but look at Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 and 28. And again, I'm not teaching on these principles in particular. I'm just simply trying to enforce upon you that these people in Corinth were listening to Jesus and trying to be obedient. Matthew chapter 20 <clears throat> and... Um, Verses 25 to 28, here's a teaching of Jesus we actually find in several places. It says, Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. But even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered, but, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so these people in Corinth, they were being serious about this by trying not to exalt themselves and allowing themselves to become servants or uh, become inferior to those who did exalt themselves. They suffered people who boasted. So what they were doing here, my friends, was godly. Paul's not speaking with sarcasm to them. They were doing it because, because it was godly. Look back in our text. Let's think about this a little bit farther here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Seeing that, uh, for ye suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. Why did they suffer these fools gladly? Because they're wise. Before we get to that, I want you to see the word gladly there. They gladly bore with people who didn't get it. People who used them, who ate, up, ate them out of house and home, 
who smote them, physically abused them perhaps, uh, people who robbed them, people who exalted themselves above them, they put up with all those things that says gladly. The Greek word is hedeos. It's related to the word hedone. We get our Greek word hedonism from it. Hedonism is living for the pleasure. In other words, this idea of, 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 of gladly is the idea of taking pleasure in suffering fools. Now, why would they do that? Why would they take pleasure in suffering fools? Because they knew something those fools did not know. That by obeying Christ, they were laying up treasures in heaven. Every one of those fools was giving them an opportunity to live like this. They were wise, weren't they? They were wise believers. And may we, brothers and sisters, live our lives as wisely as this. Again, we may disagree with some interpretation here, and I think I actually do with how they interpret some of those words, but the point is, is that we need to be understanding when we are <laughs> confronted with people who don't just, just don't get it, we understand that those are opportunities for us to be like Christ and lay up treasure in heaven. Suffer fools gladly. So Paul says in verse 18, seeing that many glory out the flesh, I will glory also. You put up with those who boast themselves. You listen to people who are fools. Now I'm going to come along and start boasting. <laughs> Since you will suffer people who exalt themselves, then I'm going to boast too. Now the interesting thing about it is, is the, what he's going to boast about. Because if you'll read, and we will in the next couple of weeks, about the verses that we read this morning in our, in, our, in our scripture reading, verses 22 to 33, notice the things that he boasts about. He doesn't boast about his eloquence. He doesn't boast about his wisdom. He doesn't boast about his intelligence. He doesn't boast about how much he knows the Lord. He boasts about what? Suffering. Okay? What were they doing? They were suffering fools. They were trying to be like Christ in suffering fools. And by the way, rightly so. Look with me, if you will, back at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. They had gotten these principles. They had gotten this, this, these, these truths that as believers, we putting up with these things are laying up treasures in heaven. He said, Paul had written to them earlier in verse uh, 17, chapter, chapter 4 and verse 7. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. I don't have it written down. It just came to mind here. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We endure things here. We endure fools who don't get it treating us badly here because we know this light affliction is laying up treasures in heaven. The Corinthians had got that. Now Paul says, listen to me while I boast. And then he begins to boast about all he had suffered, which, as he says in the, in the course of it, we'll read, he had suffered more than any other had. Any of those people in Corinth had. Any of those false apostles had. Perhaps more than any of the any other true apostles even had. Paul, Apostle Paul is saying, I'm boasting about my suffering. So you see why I said at the beginning, well played, the Apostle Paul? He understood that they would suffer people they were fools, boasting. So he says, I'm going to boast and entertain a little foolishness for a moment. I'm going to start boasting. But then when he begins to boast, he's simply saying, I suffer more than you do. I suffer more than you do. And so as they're reading this, as they're listening to this, they're starting to see this is evidence that the Apostle Paul is the true apostle of Jesus Christ. You follow that with me, okay? That's where Paul's going with all this. He's boasting not of his abilities, not of his strengths. But look at verse 30. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which, con which concern my infirmities. I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. And so verse 10 of chapter 12, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Reading our, in our text here this morning, we are in verses 16 and 21, chapter 11. Verse 21 says this, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. 
How be it, wherein sovereignty is bold, I am bold also. You see, speaking foolishly, boasting of his sufferings and afflictions for Lord Jesus to prove to these people that he was the true apostle. So that's where that goes, and I hope that it makes sense to you, kind of clarifies that for you this morning. But let's take the principles out of that, the principles that we can learn from this. The Bible tells us to have the wisdom of those who understand the sufferings that we put up in this, with on this earth, with people who are foolish, they don't get it, they don't get the realities, that putting up with those people in a kind and respectful way is laying up treasure in heaven. It is the way our Lord Jesus Christ was. It is the way we as followers of Christ should be. It's the way to be wise. And so the Apostle Paul builds on that here in this principle.